Hello, everybody. Hello and welcome. This is Alex Newton from Kalytics. Today here with Chris Fox for our webinar on ads for authors who hate mass, right? So here we go. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Hello, Chris. Hey, thanks for having me, Alex. This is going to be a great evening. Uh, we have here people already flooding into the virtual webinar room. So many people on there. It's great to have you there. Now, can you see us at this moment in time as well? Because we frankly don't know whether you can. Yes, you can see us. Here we go. So we wave at you now. So uh, just to avoid confusion, this is Alex. So I wave here. Hello, everybody. And the other dude is Chris Fox from Chris Fox Wright. So hi, everybody. I'm with the beard. Exactly. Um, I used to look like that too in another lifetime when I was still in some gaming world, but uh, now I shave. <laughs> anyway, um, it's so great to have you here, Chris. We're going to have a great evening because uh, I did find in the registration process, obviously we have a lot of authors who are A, interested in ads, and B, they uh, seem to hate maths, right? Yeah, it's a good intersection. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to confess, I'm one of those believers who love maths, but uh, I hope you can do with me in this webinar too. So everybody, are you ready for a great, great webinar here? Yes, yes, yes. Very good. Oh, yes. And I have here some people saying that they also don't hate maths. So we, we uh, keep up the torch for those people who are into numbers, but I'm sure we'll manage. It's a big, big honor for me to present to you guys Chris Fox. I know many of you, of course, know Chris, but um, I think for those of you who don't, first of all, Chris is a great friend of mine. We've worked together you know, for, for quite a while, and I think it's where a lot of common interests, passions, and beliefs in the industry meet, and I'll uh, talk more about this in just one second. Chris, for me, combines like a whole number of really great things. One is, first of all, he is an author, you know, unlike me. I mean, he really writes books and very successfully. So, I mean, you sold like more than 300,000 books on Amazon and audio uh, alone. Um, you're a great science fiction author. I just did a study on gaming literature and you did your first first game lit one and you nailed it right in there with, or you were in the top 20 or something of our study right away with the first book, which was really great, by the way. So. Here's Chris, he's a great author, but he's also a great marketeer. He believes that there's a market out there. And what is more, he's also a really, really great teacher. And I think um, sometimes you have teachers, you know, who don't know what they're really teaching. Sometimes you have amazing artists, but they cannot convey what they actually do. And that's why I really love you having here in the webinar today, Chris, uh, a great author, great marketeer and business person, a great friend and uh, a great teacher as well. So we're gonna listen today. All right, you know, our shared beliefs, Chris and I, we really believe in the idea of right to market, but but people often get it wrong. You know, even people who first joined Kalytics, they said, oh, this is only tell us where the money is, I'm gonna write for it, you know, that is not right to market. What Chris and I fundamentally believe is, you know, you have a certain love for a certain topic, so whatever, you, you, you love thrillers, right? You read them yourselves and you can imagine writing in the genre for the next 15 years without getting burned out. You know your craft, you're a great writer, you, you really know how that works and you have a certain knowledge. You know, I keep telling people, even if there's a big market out there for writing legal thrillers, if you don't have any knowledge about the legal system and legal proceeding, proceedings, you have, you know, you won't have fun or success in writing to a market where you have no knowledge, right? But then comes this zone at the bottom of this exhibit that you see here on the screen, which is the market. So Chris teaches right to market, how to find your audience, what people, the readers want. And then there's the act of marketing. So your work of art is done and you want to get it in front of people. And that is where the magic zone happens in right to market. Now today we're going to talk about this green zone and we're going to talk about the right hand side of this, the act of marketing and specifically since a lot in the book marketing world has become a, yeah, a pay to play type of environment where you have to do something to get your book in front of the readers, that is advertisements. Um, 
we want to take a closer look at that. And Chris knows what he's talking about. Now, before I hand over to him, just one more thing. We have lots and lots of people here now on the webinar. We're basically maxed out on the room capacity. And that is uh, thanks to you because you've shared the news and I ask you to share it. And we had a little draw and contest and we just did the draw before we started for a, though, amongst those person who care to share the news about the webinar. So what we have here is we want to give you a big thank you. We have one winner for the almost $2,000 value uh, Klytics lifetime membership. And Chris, the winner is, here we go, da 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 da, Catherine K. Congratulations. Congrats, Catherine. That's great. Thank you so much for helping out. I'm going to contact you via email and then uh, you're going to get your get your prize. Let's dive right in there. You know, what we want is let's have the greatest ads that there can be so that when uh, your biggest fans orders your books, the the yard in, or the street in front of your house looks like this. Now, to teach you good ads, we also we, we have a great presentation and Chris is gonna deliver what he has to teach and he has a lot to teach, but we also wanna tailor all the examples what we do also to your level of expertise a bit. So let me pull up here one little poll, which I'm launching right now with this one question here. So how would you rate your experience level related to book advertising? So are you a beginner, you've never used ads or just you know tried, got, got your feet wet or advanced, you run some ads here and there, but you know, not big budgets, the typical, you know, whatever, $5, $20 Facebook ads, that sort of things, or you're a professional, you run a lot of ads and you actually also have a pretty significant budget. Here we go. Chris, what are you thinking? Uh, well, 2% of the people here are probably gonna get very little out of what I'm about to present, and 98% of people are gonna get something that they can take away and hopefully use in their ads today. That is terrific. So let's do right that. Let's jump into this presentation. I'm gonna hand over the screen to you. I'm gonna switch off my camera um, for now, and you uh, do so the same, so we save a little bit of bandwidth. Great, the stage is yours, and here we go. Beautiful, okay. So we are here to learn why readers buy books so that we can figure out uh, how to tap into their reasoning and provide them what it is they're looking for. So as uh, Alex alluded to early on, um, all webinars are commercial in some form or other. We're trying to sell something. In, in this instance, I'm trying to sell my ads for Authors Who Hate Math course. I'm gonna tell you all about that course at the end. You'll hear more about what it can do for you guys. Um, and it's gonna be applicable, I'm sure, to a lot of you. But for now, let's focus on the skills that we can learn and we'll talk about the course at the end. So to begin with, we're all aware that advertising is painful. You know, you, you pour money in, if you're one of those people that said they were advanced and you've run some ad budgets where you put some money in, you know, you may have run across an ad that worked, but odds are good you found 10 or 12 ads that didn't work for everyone that did and ultimately lost money. And that's what a lot of us are struggling with, where you're pouring this money into advertising, it's frustrating, it, it feels like you're gambling in Vegas and you're just not getting the traction that you're after. And, and the problem really was the approach that I was taking. So today we're gonna learn what I changed to make my ad successful. And it really had to do with that approach, that mindset of figuring out who my audience is and what it is that they're interested in. And realizing that all the things that we're taught about how to locate an audience, like, oh, you need to know their, their age and their, their sex and, and where they live, that stuff's important, but that comes after the fact. You can't lead with that information and, and learn your audience, you have to indirectly find them. And, and I'm gonna show you how to do that, where you study their habits and then the patterns around them, and then you use that to determine who they are. And this was kind of the missing piece for me um, in, in finding my own audiences. And then after we figure that out, after we know who your audience is, then we're gonna talk about why they click on ads and what we can do to tap into their subconscious through the power of symbolic recognition where we can bypass their conscious mind and before they even know it, they're clicking on your book cover because they're that interested in it. So this, this uh, rather pompous slide, I suspect most of you are familiar with me already and so I probably didn't need this, but I will be getting it in places where people don't know who I am. Um, to date, I've earned about three quarters of a million dollars from publishing over the last five years. 
Um, as Alex mentioned, I have sold quite a few books. I'm doing pretty well with this. And I, and I think it's important when you guys are trying to learn something that you vet the person you're learning from. There are all sorts of books on Amazon that'll teach you these various skills about writing and marketing. But if you look at the authors that are associated with those books, they're not selling any books. So definitely vet the people that you are trying to learn from. And in my case, I, I, I feel that I, I have lived up to my qualifications. Um, up there on the upper right hand side there, you can see that's my YouTube channel. We've got almost 2 million views. So uh, there's a lot of um, video content there that you may find helpful as well if the course ends up not being your cup of tea. So the first skill that you need to have if, if you're gonna succeed in the world of authors is unfortunately um, science-based. We need to understand data science. And anybody who's read my book, Six Figure Author, understands the basics of how that works. But the bottom line is this, we're trying to teach Amazon how to sell for us. Advertising is how we do that. So basically what you're trying to do whenever you launch a brand new book is say to Amazon, okay, I'm gonna show you 250 people in a very, very narrow audience that I have selected. And based on that 250 people, you're gonna rush out and try and find every other person who looks like them that might be interested in my book. And if you do this successfully, you can make a lot of money. So this is a book that I have right now. It's number one in all of its categories as we speak. If you pop onto Amazon, you'll see that in, in all of the relevant categories. But what's important here is the curve. Notice how it just keeps going up. And what's happening here is not I am spending more money or I'm advertising more or I'm increasing my budget. It's I set a fixed ad spend of about $100 a day. I targeted it carefully and I let it loose. And that audience that I was targeting was all military science fiction fans. And as soon as Amazon figured out who was interested in my book, now they're showing it everywhere. And of course, it's just keep you know going up and up and up in rank and in income, which ultimately is our goal. So you're going to actually make a lot more money than the base ad spend. It's not as simple as you spend $100 and you sell $300 in books. It's you spend $100, you, send, you maybe get $120 back in books, but then over the next two months, Amazon promotes you and you make $1,500 more. It, it, that's how really we're, we're making our money from Amazon today. And I really understood my audience. That was the first core principle why I was able to do this. Because if you take that pillar away and you just try to funnel some advertising money in it and you show them the wrong audience, then Amazon is hamstrung. They're going to use that wrong audience to try and peddle your book and they're going to fail because it's actually not being put in front of the right people. And that is why it is so important to know who your audience is and then teach Amazon who they are. So that's remedial for I'm sure a lot of you guys in the, the room. Um, you're familiar with it up to that point, like, okay, we need to know who our audience is and we need to show Amazon, but how do you do that? Like, how do you know exactly who your audience is? And, and this is where the rubber hits the road and it's gonna require a lot of work on your part. You're gonna have to do a lot of thinking. And I would start by becoming your target reader. And, and hopefully some of you have role played in the past, either through a work experience, or maybe you played some Dungeons and Dragons when you were a kid, but basically you're method acting. You were assuming a role, you're acting like you were a person other than yourself. And so what you should be doing is you're learning more about your target reader is building this second character in your head that is the target reader you're trying to sell books to. And you wanna ask yourself questions like, how do they buy books? Why do they buy books? What are they getting out of reading the books? You wanna keep asking questions constantly. And the first largest question you need to ask is, is your target reader an occasional reader or a habitual reader? And, and you're gonna hear lots of terms across you know, different platforms, habitual reader, whale reader. Um, I've heard all sorts of terms. But what I mean by a habitual reader is someone who reads a book or more every single day. Habitual readers, their whole entertainment is reading. And this was me from age, eh, I'm gonna say eight to about 22. I would read a book every single day. Ideally, that was a fantasy novel. If I couldn't find a fantasy novel, it'd be a science fiction novel. Uh, if I couldn't find either, I would reread something that I had already read in the past. And I binged literally thousands of books. And thanks to Kindle Unlimited, the modern version of like, let's say 12 year old Chris can do exactly the same thing and they can binge books constantly. But it's not that hard for me to look back at the, the mindset that I had as habitual reader Chris. And one of the things that I realized is that reader was very price conscious. I couldn't afford to buy a bunch of books. There was no way I could buy a book every day. I needed the library. 
So if you're selling your books at $5 a pop, you're not going to have a habitual reader buy them at $5 a piece and buy book after book after book. They need a cheaper way to digest them. And so if your readers are habitual, you want to be sensitive to that when you are pricing for your ads. Like you're going to probably use 99 cents as a price point for habitual readers, whereas for occasional readers, you might be able to get away with $5.99. Um, habitual readers also have a very short memory and, and this is because they read so much. Only the books that really stuck up, uh, stuck out to me as a child stayed with me and I remembered the authors. The others, the hundreds of ones that were just okay, I completely forgot about them. And six months later, I, I couldn't even tell you that I had read that book. If I saw the cover, I might recognize it, but I wouldn't be able to tell you the title or who that author was. Well, habitual readers today are exactly the same way and they do have that short memory, but they love to read so much that they'll often devour your entire backlist in a matter of hours, which is just it's crazy watching them go through book after book after book. Occasional readers read a handful of books a year. And the reason for this usually is not that they don't love to read. Most occasional readers were at one time in their life habitual readers. So at age 22, for me, I started playing more video games. I had gotten married. Um, really, I, my life was changing and I was finding more, new and different forms of entertainment and so I had less time to read. I also had more money because I suddenly had a job which was pressing down on my time so I wasn't nearly as price conscious. And what I found is that I would only read top quality stuff. If I found really good authors, I'd pay whatever it took. If it was $25 for a new release, that was fine. I'd buy it because I was loyal to that specific author and I needed to know what happened. Um, the problem, of course, with occasional readers is because they're occasional readers, they may only read a small segment of your backlist. So I am a Brandon Sanderson fan, for example. He is a, a, a very large fantasy author in the traditional world, and I don't read all of his stuff. I only follow certain of his series, and, and that's going to be the case for most occasional readers. So what you're trying to do as an author is figure out, do I want habitual or occasional readers? If you're writing urban fantasy, for example, your bread and butter is going to be habitual readers, and you need to be aware of that. If you are writing, say, thrillers, many of your readers may actually be occasional and they're looking for a good thriller that's gonna really impact them, like a techno thriller or something, um, then you might be able to lean on that a bit more. And so I'm fortunate enough that I write in enough genres that I actually have fan bases that, that overlap in both. And you will find that regardless of which of these two audiences you're appealing to, you're gonna get members of both. So just because you're marketing to occasional readers doesn't mean you won't also get habitual readers. Once you've answered that question, um, traditional advertising wisdom tells us we should determine the age, gender, and occupation of these people. And they are important and they're super useful. And if we could just know them, I, I, that would be awesome. It'd make it so much easier to sell books. But if you say, okay, I think that because I am a 42 year old, you know, software engineer who likes geeky stuff, that that's going to be my audience member. And I totally discount women because I'm a man and I'm only thinking from a male standpoint, I may have just cut out like 50% or more of my audience. So we can't really determine age, gender, or occupation until we get additional data. For occupation, as an example, I move a lot of audiobooks. It's a huge part of my revenue. Well, many of the people that listen to my books, they're long haul truckers. I've gotten emails from tons and tons of long haul truckers who say, thank you so much, Chris, I'm on the road 60 hours a week and, and audiobooks have saved my life. Well, I didn't know that and I couldn't have guessed that ahead of time. The only way for me to know that was to hear from long haul truckers and to start building that data. And this is where we get to indirect targeting. Because if you can't know their age and their gender and their location ahead of time, well, we still gotta find them, how do we do that? Well, if you, if you can't see them directly, you find where they've been. It's like a, a, a tracker following a trail. You're looking to see what clues your target audience has left. Now, theoretically, you were at some point in your favorite genre. If you, like me, write military science fiction, then you probably like military science fiction and, and read it a lot at some point in your life. Well, what you wanna ask is, when that was you, when you were part of your target audience, or if you're not in there anymore and you never were, and you're looking at people that are in it now, what are their favorite movies? What do they like to watch? So today in the theater, what are they gonna see? Did they see Avengers Endgame? What was their favorite movie in 1990? How about 2000? How about 2010? You know, and, and you see where I'm going with this. You can repeat it for earlier or later years. Like if you're writing and you think that your age demographic is probably gonna be mostly retirees, let's say, you know, age 60 plus, then you can go back further than 1990. If you're writing Westerns and you're aimed at that group, then you're gonna do things like 
um, look for Bonanza and Gunsmoke and, and the movies that were big during that time period because those will really hit the nostalgia of that target audience. It's really trying to figure out what is important in the, the media, what was going on at that time that they may have seen. So it's not just movies. You also want to do the same thing with the books, TV shows, games, um, media events, like, you know, the assassination of, of somebody important somewhere, like a, a president, like, you know, uh, 9-11. I mean, any sort of cultural event, you want to ask yourself, how did this influence them? And, and think from the perspective of your audience. If I am Joe Reader, this person I'm building in my head, answer what their favorite game was for all this, movie, book, all of it. Like, fill this all up. And then try to harness as many more questions as you possibly can. Um, when I met my wife, we did it on a dating site called OKCupid, which I absolutely love. And what it does, it just keeps asking you questions. You know, do you want kids? Um, do you smoke? How do you feel about drugs? You know, it goes down all these questions and you build a profile that has a percentage match. Well, you kind of want to do the same thing for your audience where you want to ask them a whole bunch of questions. Turn on your inner five-year-old and start asking why, 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 and trying to learn more and more and more about what your audience is interested in. And then once you've done that, you can actually come back and start figuring out what their age is and stuff because you're going to run ads and Facebook will tell you, oh, these are the people that like your stuff. And that's how you get that data. And the beauty of going through the process that I just outlined for you, and I know that was pretty quick, but if you go through all these movies and books and games and things that people would have been interested in in every phase of their life, you now have a gigantic keyword list that can be used on Amazon and on Facebook and Reddit and any other website where you are currently advertising. Those are gonna be super, super useful. Plus, you now know a lot more about your audience and what their likes or dislikes are. You know, did they like Battlestar Galactica? How do they feel about Lonesome Dove? You know. Try to figure out what they're interested in and why and what their hot buttons were. Um, Game of Thrones is pretty important right now. If we look at Game of Thrones, how did they feel about the last season of Game of Thrones? If you're a fan of that show, how does your audience feel about it? Because the answer could really inform what you write going forward. Theoretically, if we've gone through the process that I just outlined, you have now managed to cobble together enough information that you, you kind of know who your audience is. Well, how do you get them to actually click on one of your ads? Because that's the, the second half of the puzzle. Now you know who they are. How do we actually get them to buy what we're selling? Well, every word that you know, every color, every number is a symbol. The way our brains work is they are constantly looking for patterns and then codifying those patterns in the ways that we tell them to do it. So if you see a certain band of radiation, we're gonna label that as blue or red. We actually create colors for those things and then we agree as a society that the color blue is this. But ultimately, the color blue um, the word dragon, the word apple, these are all just symbols we've created. They're sounds that we're making that if somebody doesn't understand your language, it just sounds like gibberish. But to us, they're symbols. They're symbols that we've created. When I say, let's get back to the word dragon. When I say the word dragon, you have an image in your head. And if you're, if you're in the West, that dragon probably had red scales and probably breathed fire and probably had wings and a tail um, and might have been able to talk and cast magic. If you were in China, that dragon's gonna look considerably different. It probably doesn't have wings. So your symbol can vary from location to location, but it's your job as an author to understand what symbols are important to your audience, why they're important, and then how you can tap into them. So I'm gonna keep leaning on dragons. If dragons are important to my target audience because I write uh, for fantasy readers, then I'm gonna show them images of dragons in my ads because I know that they're gonna have a visceral, emotional reaction to seeing a dragon. And the reason for this is complex, and I'm not gonna to get too deep into the science because your eyes will, will glaze over. I mean, this is for a course, you know, for people who hate math, you probably don't love science that much either. Um, light is simply radiation. And Albert Einstein defined it as quanta that bounce around. So what happens is quanta bounce around inside your eye and your eye parses that radiation into patterns. So this is how we see things. So if you're looking at a bunch of icons scrolling by on a screen for like Netflix or Amazon, your brain is looking at that radiation and parsing it and trying to find things it recognizes. And sometimes it'll get a false positive. Sometimes your brain will say, oh my God, that's a snake. But then when you give it a second look, it's just a stick. That's the power of a symbol. So if you've ever been walking along a trail and thought you saw a spider or thought you saw a snake, 
and you felt the adrenaline surge and you felt everything happen in you internally, you can see the power of symbols. There was no snake. The snake never actually existed. All that was happening was your brain reacting to the presence of a symbol. And since snake means danger, it reacted accordingly. The same thing can be true for the symbols in your genre. We're leaning on uh, right to market a little bit. So uh, Alex talked about this on that first slide. For me, one of the most important tenets of writing to market is understanding emotional resonance. And this is the why of why people are reading. And this is how we suss out what symbols are important to them. So once upon a time, when I was about the same age as the kid in this picture, um, my parents got into a custody battle and my mom lost. And rather than turn my brother and I over to the authorities to go back to my dad, she kidnapped us. So for the next, uh, I wanna say 12 months, we were on the, on the run. I changed my name to uh, Todd, my brother became Alex, and we lived on the run. I was literally on the back of a milk carton. And the reason this is important is you remember I said I was a habitual reader from age eight to age 22. Well, I, the kidnapping happened when I was eight. And what I learned is while my entire world was out of my control and I had no agency and I had no control, I could read about hobbits or assistant pig keepers or, or people that were just little boys like me who would grow into powerful heroes and kings and eventually seize control of their own destiny. The emotional resonance I was seeking was power. I wanted to know that I mattered and could seize control and could grow and mature and that I wouldn't always be a kid who couldn't fix the problems that were happening in the world around me. Well, if your genre is romance, the emotional resonance is going to be quite different. If, you know, it's thrillers, again, quite different. If you're writing nonfiction, you know, people are try trying probably to improve themselves. So your goal is to understand the emotional resonance that is tied to this genre that you're writing. And then from that emotional resonance, start building a list of symbols. And then we can use these symbols on Amazon. So looking at this image, how many symbols can you spot? And I don't actually expect you to answer this, but do this in your own head. Some of these symbols are obvious. Like you'll notice that most of these covers have a spaceship on them. In fact, all six on this screenshot have a spaceship, at least one spaceship on them. Spaceships is one of the most potent symbols, and that makes sense because it's in space fleet science fiction. You better show me a fleet or, or you know, I'm not going to see the symbol that I need to see that tells me, that signals to me, this is something I'm interested in. But there are other symbols, too, and these are less obvious. Notice that the first two books on this page are both box sets and that both of these images convey you're going to get a box of books. So if you look at number three, four, five, and six, you're just getting one book. But if you look at number one and two, you're getting six books for the price of one. And that's visually intuitive without me having to say a word simply because I used a 3D cover. That's the power of symbols. Titles are symbols as well. You'll notice that I use Void Wraith. Void Wraith is very potent because the words void and wraith are used all over science fiction and combining them as I did was very effective. Armor World over here for B.V. Larson probably doesn't mean as much to you guys, but if you're a science fiction fan, you, you've you seen this used over and over and over, and you've seen it used in this specific font by B.B. Larson whenever he's publishing a novel, so his audience knows, oh, a new book just came out in the Undying Mercenaries series. That is symbols. He's tapping into symbols where he has taught his audience to associate his branding um, as a symbol in their own head, so they'll respond to it when he publishes a book. So Chris, I, I really... Go ahead. Chris, just one comment here directly from the audience. A couple, a couple of people here saying, hey, this symbol stuff makes so much sense. And I'm also myself sitting here with a big aha because, you know, in, in the Kalytics reports, we look at the top selling book covers, right? And and they all look the same. Well, and some people even dismiss it like, oh, they look all the same. Shouldn't I be doing something different, right? And now I'm really seeing what these top authors are actually doing. Well, they say if the, if the agreement among the readers leadership is that this is the symbols that we subconsciously reach for you know you make use of it and uh, you're really opening my eyes here as to as as to what is behind the things that work it's it's really great so we have great feedback in here oh my god yes ariel says uh, great feedback from the audience just wanted to let you know what's really fun is you can subvert this so for example if you think symbols will work and people have not seen those symbols before. So everybody in a, in a given genre is using the same thing. So like, let's say it's urban fantasy and you've got a, a beautiful heroine with a hand fart magic spell in her hand. Like that, that's pretty much every UF cover. 
you can yep. try something different. So in my case, uh, most people have probably heard of it at this point, Tech Mage, my space fantasy series, I used spaceships and dragons. And you can layer those symbols and you can layer symbols that other people aren't using. If you're writing in fantasy and dragons are important, so are thrones, so are swords, um, so are crowns. Like you can lean on any one of those symbols. So if everybody else is using a different symbol, you can actually kind of sneak up on them and get some market share by finding another symbol that works just as well that people aren't tapping into yet. Um, wow, yeah. brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And th this may also an answer to a question just, you know, we have the Q&A later, but it's so pertinent to hear because we have here the question coming up. Well, what do you do with like cross genre type of books, you know, that, that tap into different genres? And I, I think you just mentioned these symbols could be exactly the answer. Yeah, you, you put a symbol on the cover from both. So in the case of a cross genre book, you pick the primary genre and that's the primary symbol that you put on the cover. And then whatever the secondary genre that you're crossing in that you want to be clear to the reader, you put an element of that secondary genre on the cover. So they're saying, like in my case, oh, I've got this giant dragon and then behind it, I see a spaceship. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was the guys, believe it or not, that was the presentation. What are the commercial parts? So I'll run through this real quick and then we'll get to questions. Um, the course that I put together is basically four hours of what you just heard. So we talked a little bit about a couple of the skills that we cover. Um, there are 14 modules. Symbolic recognition is one of them, but there are a lot of other ones that will teach you how to find your audience, how to find images to use, because you're going to need a whole bunch of them. You can't have three pictures of a dragon. You need 30. And, and I, I will teach you how to gather those images and test with them and how to gather audiences and how to write ad copy and test various parts to see what types of ad copy your audience will resonate with. So it's more of everything you just heard. Um, but probably the number one takeaway for me, and this was because like you guys, I am a working author. Um, I don't have a big staff or anything. I'm running all my own ads at this point. Um, you need to learn to systematize your advertising. And I did it by putting it in 30 minute time blocks. So I'll do things like on day one, my first 30 minute time block is I'll define an audience. And then on day two, I'll gather images. And day three, I'll write ad copy. And then day four, I'll make a bunch of ads. And then on day five, which will probably be a couple of days after day four, I'll prune ads. So you're, you're siloing activities into these 30 minute time blocks and I'll teach you all about how to do that. And then finally, um, I go into the pros and cons of all the major advertising platforms. The most exciting one for most people is Reddit because the vast majority of people have not used Reddit. Um, I'll, I'll warn you now, Reddit is not some big gold mine you could tap into and get rich. It's not the next big thing, um, but it is useful and it's another tool you can have in your arsenal. I do talk about that plus the ones you probably have heard of. So, excuse me, if you are a beginning advertiser or an intermediate advertiser, this could be really, really useful for you. If you are that 2% of people that are pros, unless you're looking for a reason to give Alex and I money, you, you, know, <laughs> you, could, you could keep your wallet closed. Um, but we are to the questions portion of it. I'm going to leave this link up for the time being so you guys can see if you're interested in actually purchasing the course, there's a link right there and it'll take you right to it. There's an intro video you can watch to get some more details on it. And of course, you can browse the curriculum before you purchase it. So uh, yeah, I will open it up to questions. And I guess, um, Alex, I'll turn presenter right back over to you. Yeah, so while, while we do this, I'm also posting the link here in the um, in the chat box. So, you know, hop over to uh, to the platform where where the course is available. Um, once you get to that landing page, you will uh, see two possibilities. You can use either roads, the top one or the bottom one. If you click on the bottom one, you also get immediately an overview of the of the course. So um, jump over there. And uh, Chris is also, um, Chris, you said you're also going to have some uh, bonus in there for our audience. So uh, why don't you comment uh, briefly on that and then we'll jump into the overall Q&A. I do. I do. So the bonus that I wanted to offer, guys, is going to be different than, than what you'd normally get from a course. I'm not going to open up my time. I am actually going to do office hours for people that are registering off the back of this phone call. And we're going to have a meeting with just people that are coming from the Kalytics tribe. And I'm going to go over your ads. And so we'll do these office hours where you guys get to answer questions. Now, this is going to happen after you've completed the course. So you'll get a few weeks to go through the course, to make some ads, to start seeing how they work. And then we're going to get together as a group. And if, if things aren't working for you, we're going to find out why. We're going to do it together. So I will offer you guys that as a bonus. I'm happy to give you some, some of my time to help you get your ads working if you guys sign up to the course. And that's really amazing, Chris. So thank you so much for doing this because I know you're, you're a writer too. So if the book 
get doesn't get written, it doesn't get written, right? So um, you, you spending significant time with with the Kalytics folks is just wonderful. So thank you so much for doing this. We already have a whole bunch of questions coming in. So while people jump over uh, to the link, which is klytics.com, that's k-lytics.com slash ads2019, very simple link. Uh, while people jump over there, let's uh, dive into a couple of the questions we have coming up there. Um, so uh, first off here, the question was, we talk all about Amazon. One question was immediately, hey, uh, can I also run my ads actually on Audible as well? And can I apply this to the Audible sales site as well, what we're learning in the course? Uh, you are not able to run Audible ads directly, but you can run Facebook ads are my most profitable center right now for audio ads. Um, it's much less competitive than selling eBooks right now because far fewer people have audio books. So I've constantly got uh, Facebook ads running and that's selling almost all of my audio books at the moment. The rest of them are sold by just being linked on the product pages. So if you're advertising to your eBook page and the eBook is linked to the audio book, you're just naturally gonna get some extra sales. That, that's terrific. And you're going to be covering Facebook ads as well, I presume, in, in the course here as well. I do. I do. So Facebook, Amazon, Reddit, and BookBub ads are covered in the course. That, that's great. We covered the cross-genre question. The, the next one we had here, um, there is always this talk about how to teach Amazon. You mentioned this. Is this something uh, going to be covered in the in the course? And can you can you elaborate a little bit more of, of what you mean by teaching Amazon with your ads? Sure. So that's covered in the book, Six Figure Author. Um, you, I would just recommend reading the book, to be honest. Um, it, it's very short. You can read it in an hour, hour and a half. Uh, but what it's talking about is, is data science and how companies use it. So they have created something called a classifier, which you can think of as an artificial intelligence. And that artificial intelligence is looking at more factors than any human could possibly track. And so when you give it 500 people, it looks at those 500 people and everything it could possibly look at about them. And what do they buy? And where do they live? And what are they interested in? And then it'll synthesize more people based off of that. And if you can tell Amazon, okay, here's 500 people and they're all rabid science fiction fans, Amazon has the capability of replicating that and going and finding every other science fiction fan like them and then showing your book to them. That's terrific, that's terrific. Then um, there was uh, one question, by the way, you get already hear great feedbacks on, on the books that you did. Talking of books, there was one question because you're launching this great course with the extra bonus of like private coaching time, but you also codified some of uh, the knowledge in the book. And there was a, a question, the ads for um, the ads for authors who hate math book versus the course. So what's over and above there in the course and why should people go for the course? Uh, if you want extra help, if you want examples, if you want to see how it all works and get information, if you want a community of people to learn with and the course makes sense. If you are a do-it-yourselfer and you don't talk to a lot of authors and you don't like authors communities and um, you learn very quickly on your own, that's why I wrote the book. The book is five bucks. It'll teach you 80% of what's in the course. Um, you, you do lose a lot in that you're not seeing the video stuff and you're not getting to see the screen walkthroughs of what I'm working on. Um, probably the biggest loss is you're, you're not getting fellow students to work with, so you can't learn from other people that are at your level. Um, but again, if that's not something you need, and if you're a self-starter, the book is fine. That's great. That's great. Um, now, the, the other question that came up here is, how about symbols that you see a lot of readers are saying that they are, they are fed up with uh, with a genre? For example, the, the, the woman narrator, I think what, the, what Simon is asking for, you know, how do you make the trade-off between popular and working symbols and potentially uh, it being oversaturated or people just getting no longer reacting to it as, as they should? Or is, is that not an issue? Um, I highly recommend subscribing to the service called Klytics, which I look at um, whenever a new report comes out for my genre. And that's what I use as a starting point to look and see how things are, are changing. Like, let's say you write vampires and vampires are doing great, but you get the sense that maybe it's starting to wane. You can go look at the vampire genre and you'll see covers begin to change. You'll see that the top book with a vampire symbol on it maybe is lower ranked than it used to be and that's sort of how you judge it so you can either go to Kalytics and see how you know genres are changing over time because that'll do the heavy lifting for you or if like me you prefer to do things manually just go start looking at covers in your genre and over time if you do this regularly like once a week during your lunch hour you go browse covers in your genre you'll start seeing the trends that are changing over time and you'll realize oh that that symbol that's probably been overdone 
That that's great. That's great. I'm just looking here. Also, if if you give me like a short break here, the questions they, they you know they're coming in. I'm trying to sort them a little bit because we have a lot of them coming up. And rest assured, we also have a protocol of the question so if for any reason we don't get to your questions chris and i are going to go through the chat protocol and really try to get an answer to you if we haven't uh answered it in here um how much time do you recommend to do this course uh you know is this is this a course that will take weeks to do and you know do uh, do you get in the uh, perhaps you can talk a little bit not just about the monetary investment people do but also the time investment they they'll have if they do the course uh, that's a great question. Um, we have about 300 students so far, and so I've been kind of watching them to see how they're doing this. And it looks like the vast majority of people hit the ground running. Most of the modules are super short, and so they fly through the first half of the course in like a day. And then the second half of the course tends to take them about two weeks to get through. And that varies a little bit depending on how quick that they're working, but I can see that as they're completing modules and sort of watch the bulk of students go through it. So I would say you know, allow for about two weeks. Um, I'm going to allow four weeks for, for slower students before I do office hours. That way, everybody's definitely finished before we're all working together. They're very good. Um, then there was the question of, well, one question is, is, is the book also included in, in, in the course or is, is the course the course, the book, the book? That was one question. Uh, the course is here. the course of the book is the book. And in hindsight, that might have been smart to do to bundle it together. And I guess maybe in the future, I'll put that together. Um, but right now, if you want the book, you unfortunately have to buy it on Amazon. Right. And we also had here one question, you know, could you show any sample ads? And it's probably with the screen sharing and the time that's not going to work out. But that's also the whole point of the course is people really get help. They get examples. They get the screenshots. You know, they they get the walkthroughs because, I mean, a book is a book and, and a course is a course. That's also, I think, an important difference to make here. One of the most important modules and, and probably the most popular was the pruning module. And it's 30 minutes of me just going through my ads and ripping them apart and canceling and changing budgets and so I, I think the only way to really show that stuff is is to have you go through the course and actually see it in its its element if that makes sense great and then we got the question here from uh laura how many books should you have out before you really hit the market with your ad so you know is it worthwhile if you only have one or it's your first one or should you have a portfolio uh so when can people get courageous and get out there and and spend money on ads I think three is the magic number. And the idea is, and this is assuming they're in a series, so let's say you've got a trilogy out. Um, if you put the first book at 99 cents, the second book at, let's say, 399, and the third book at 499, there's enough money there, especially if you're in Kindle Unlimited, and especially if you have audio, for you to make a profit advertising in today's marketplace. Um, it's where you're advertising one book that you run into an uphill battle, and it can still be done. Uh, the book that um, Alex mentioned earlier, The Dark Lord Burt, uh, my gamelet book, yeah. I don't have any other books in that genre. I only have the one book, and I, I'm selling it at $3.99, and I'm just barely making a profit on the ads running it. So it's possible with one book. It's, I won't say easy, but easier with three or more. Great. Uh, then we have already a couple of people who signed up here. Uh, thank you very much for doing so. And they immediately, immediately ask, when is the call with Chris? So <laughs> <laughs> I'll pull you guys via um, email and we'll, we'll choose it. So I'll give you guys three times to choose from. And then we as a group will select what the best time is and we'll get that set up. That that is great. Then uh, also a couple of you know more marketing tactical type of questions here. If we have the time, let's also dive into a couple of those. There were um, questions such as here. You know, as a slow rider with a small backlist, I try to compensate with higher prices. And um, are Facebook and BookBub ads will they be profitable under these cir circumstances? Uh, and Facebook, you, yes. BookBub, in my experience, no. Um, and that's something that David Gogren has, has confirmed if you guys have read his book. He's pretty pretty open about it. If you want to sell on BookBub, you're doing it at 99 cents. Uh, but with Facebook, there are still markets where you can do things full price. It is getting harder. It used to be really easy to sell box sets at like $7.99 or $9.99. And it's definitely harder than it used to be. But you know, you, you could still do it if you're doing it well. Right. That's great. And and then the question was, how many, um, well, we had the how many books, but here, how effective are smaller ads for those who don't have like the hundred dollars or more type of uh, type of budget? So I think that's the other question, you know, how big an investment are people committing to when they get start getting their feet wet and then potentially ramping up with their ads? 
they're extremely useful and very, very scalable. So like even a $5 a day is perfect, like $150 a month in ad spend. If you have more time than money to throw at ads, what you can do is look for those tiny little niches and you can find those keywords. So if you did the exercises where you were looking at all those movies and TV shows and books from different decades, you can find these obscure ones that nobody's using and you can get low cost per click on that and you can make five dollars go a long way if you're willing to kind of do that experimentation so you definitely can trade um, time for money in terms of advertising in that excellent now here's a question also a good one you know i mean you you're uh, obviously a great sci-fi author and you know fledgling out into other adjacent genres as well um, we have here uh, Rhonda is asking well i'm a clean a clean and wholesome romance writer do you in your course also have examples outside the uh, the sci-fi books, you know, and do you touch up on other genres as well? I do, I do. Um, now here's the thing. I only have science fiction books in my catalog and all of the video footage is of my KDP dashboard. So you're hearing things from a sci-fi bent. But when we're talking about things like symbols, I'm discussing symbols from many different genres and we romance is actually one of the examples I use quite frequently because it is very large. Plus, I got to be honest, man, your, your symbols and romance are so easy, man. A, a shirtless chest being a symbol is really, really nice because that's easy to lean on endlessly. Um, but yes, I, I do have a lot of romance specific stuff in the course. Excellent. Excellent. And if you have many romance students, you might venture into that genre too, finally, and conquer it, right? So there we go. Um, then we have here, do you feel, um, Andrew asks, that in 2019, we've seen the ad prices, you know, uh, rise and uh, what's your take on, are, are Amazon ads becoming too expensive? Any point of view on that, on of how to handle the, the rising ad costs? And is it rising? per se, it is really, rising. you know. Um, it'll continue to rise, it'll never stop rising. It's only ever gonna go in one direction and that's gonna be up, our margins will keep going down, but it'll start to stabilize. And if you market effectively and you learn these skills now, you're way, way, way ahead of the curve. In terms of the technology curve, over 50% of authors in the world still don't even know you can sell books on Amazon. So you are definitely ahead of that curve and if you learn these skills now, um, you'll be able to take it much further. Uh, I think the larger your backlist is, the safer you are. So in two years, it's going to be way more expensive to advertise than it is today. But if you've written eight more books in that time, then you're making enough extra money that you can compensate. So you're sort of racing that rising tide, if you will. That's great. That's great. Now, in the chat, I had some person say they uh, she, she had problems with um, uh, whatever the firewall or something. So I put also an alternative bit.ly link into the chat box. Otherwise, you know, the uh, kalytics.com slash ads 2019 should work. If it doesn't work for you, um, here's a bit.ly link, which is bit.ly slash 2019 Chris Fox. I couldn't do ads 2019 because I was already taken. So just in case you have any problems with the link or there's too much traffic going to it so you can use that as well and guys um, i'll extend this um chris at chrisfoxwrites.com is my email address if you run into technical problems of any kind um or just have feedback or an issue let me know absolutely and you know for those of you who have established communications with my support uh email just shoot a mail we'll, we'll get it sorted out for you um then here there were a couple of more questions on the one-on-ones that you put in as a bonus to, to this, or uh, well, there was a question, is it one-on-ones or is it going to be group calls? That was a it's little bit unclear. Be, to it'll be a group call. What I found is um, there's some value to one-on-ones, but there's far more value to you as an author to be in a group of 40 other people on a phone call and to have three other people in your genre have their ads picked apart. You're like, okay, I get to see three romance books all torn apart in front of me. Ah, uh, now I'm learning some stuff. And, and I think that's more useful to you guys as a group. So that's how I'm gonna run it. That's, that's great. Um, very good. Now, th there's also a question, but not directly related to the course, but uh, I assume the answer is yes. There was a question was whether you're also available for private consultations, whether you do consulting. And uh, I guess the answer is yes. Yeah, I uh, always do see you do private coaching projects as well. Is that right, Chris? It, it is. I charge a lot. I do. Um, I charge way too much money for it. And I'm always surprised when somebody takes me up on it. I ask $1,000 an hour. Um, if somebody's in need, I've discounted that down to $500 an hour to help people out. But most of the time when somebody asks if they want to work with me, I tell them, you're, you're probably better off saving your money. Um, I can say that every last person I've worked with has made more money than they spent uh, on, on the call with me. So if you do think it's worthwhile and you want to work with me, you certainly can. But again, I'm very, very pricey. That's, well, you know, 
value has its price quality you know quality has its price so that's uh, uh good to know but thanks for also for answering this one john said i just signed up thank you very much for joining we have a whole number of people uh who just joined and um you know it's great i i know you know from working with chris he's really going to do a great job uh, i looked at his course i looked through the modules i watched actually a couple of them myself because you know um, and this whole symbol stuff, you know, it's not just for books. It's, I mean, for marketing per se. And many of us, you know, whether you have an author website, you know, where you can apply the learnings to, whether you have adjacent products, even whatever the T-shirts you sell at book signings or whatever you do, you know, think about these symbol stuff and and who who the readers are. I I, I love this content when I when I watched it. All right, so there's still somebody saying still uh, clicking the button and in waiting mode. So let let me just also re, uh, repost here in the chat the Bitly link. I hope that Teachable is not ha having any problems because they are a, a big, uh, big platform. So they, there, there shouldn't be any problems with this one. So I'm just reposting the Bitly link as well as the Kalytic slash. I, I will uh, say when I, I first um, debuted the early access, we ran into a couple of problems where people had hiccups getting signed up. So uh, I have had Teachable have the occasional issue. Good to know. Well, it also shows how popular <laughs> how popular the course already is. So, uh, you know, if it doesn't work out now, we're also going to send out a replay link. We're going to talk about whether we put the presentation in there. You're going to have a replay, can watch it all again. As said, we also will look at the questions. Let's do a couple of more closing questions be before we are at the full hour. Um, before we do, give us some feedback here was this useful so much uh useful for you already yes 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 we have here a whole number of big thank you big thank yous now very useful john says he says yes you know it's great because this is what you know in in a way we're also artists you know and and it's always we can't see the audience so the chat box is for us the only way to communicate and then we take up one-on-one -on -one conversations but we have here a whole flood of things um things coming in and Lee says, well, if it weren't, I wouldn't have signed up. And you're so right. So <laughs> we're glad we lived up to the to the expectations. Now, uh, let's take, a, you know, the last two, three content questions before we close off. I think it's not very often, Chris, that people have us both here uh, on, on one webinar and screen. We should do this more often at that point in time. It's Agreed. Fun. I mean, this is fun. I love this stuff. And uh, it's uh, yeah, it's 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 really great teamwork here. So um, let's look at a couple of uh, the last questions here. <laughs> and here, by the way, it was uh, that's a big compliment. Thank you so much, Sandy. Because here is the the answer. Yes, I'm part of the two percent, so uh, a professional. But it was very helpful about target markets, and uh, she went and um, and bought six figure authors. So well, thank, thank you very much. You know, that's great feedback to have. I think here was one uh, one closing question was there are obviously a, a whole couple of, of um, ad courses out there all by great people. And, you know, uh, the question was there, you know, what does your course differentiate from the others? And are there is there a particular audience to which your course is particularly a, a good fit? Yeah, I, I would say the difference between my course and say I'll bring up Mark Dawson because I love Mark. Um, Mark's course is very hands-on, and it's the course that is most famous to people. Everybody knows about his um, his ads course. Um, I think that's super useful for, for people that are getting into this at, at a low level and need a bunch of basic information. Um, this course is more about principles. I think what's missing, well, I don't know if missing is the right thing, but what Mark's course doesn't focus on is how and why people buy stuff. It shows you how to do an ad in, in Facebook and gives you some examples. And so you'll get the technical know-how by the end of that course where you can make a Facebook ad or you can make an Amazon ad or whatever platform you're on, you're proficient in it, but you won't walk away knowing why your target audience is your target audience and why they're buying stuff. And that is what my course does. That's great. Excellent. Um, terrific. We covered a lot of questions. I know there are also, uh, you know, a couple ones that we, we haven't answered. It's not that we are shy of an answer. I'm always impressed, Chris, when we talk with, with you about advertising, I, I can, this is not rehearsed, right? And I, I can shoot almost like any question to you and you always have an answer or an opinion. And, uh, even if you didn't have one, you would say so. But it's 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 great, you know. People in these webinars can can just throw questions to you, and they get an expert answer. So 
I really want to thank you for sharing your time here. Um, as said, the offer is going to be um, is going to be up there. We put it up there with a replay. We're still going to debate whether it's going to be a, a time limited or evergreen offer because you know your time with a group call is uh, is probably also you know limited in time. So if you want to make sure you know use it over the next seven seven to ten days when we also have the re replay up, that's where you're definitely going to have the bonus to the course with the not the one-on-one -on -one, but the you know very precious group calls that chris is doing with these courses so if you haven't jumped over yet just you know check it out once again it's klytics.com that's k-lytics.com slash ads 2019 get your copy today and uh, we'll see you at the at the group call which is then going to happen in due course chris some final words from you yeah, thank you guys so much for your time. I mean, there are so many different courses out there and a lot of webinars going on, and it does take, you know, some, um, there's a lot of skepticism, I know. And, and I really appreciate you guys sitting through this and, and giving me your time. And, and thank you for that. It was really a privilege. I, I enjoy teaching a lot, and you guys have been great. Excellent, Chris. Thank you so much to everybody in the world. I know we have people, you know, even people in Sydney and New Zealand. I know it's like virtually middle of the night over there. So a big thank you to everybody around the globe who joined. Uh, you're going to get the replay link. We look forward to welcoming you in Chris's course. This is Alex Newton from Kalytics, ebook market intelligence for success. Bye for now.